and then Microsoft Teams in St. John's ID and uploaded the PowerPoint into St. John's. Uh, yeah, Wi-Fi. so the upload into the St. John's one is done. I'll okay. just try. Uh, I'll just try uh, opening it in that ID. Just a second. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So it's done apparently. Okay. We're still uh, getting people uh, who are slowly coming into the meeting. We. Okay. We will wait for some more time for people, for students to okay. join. So I, I still don't have an option like that. Uh, just a second. Okay. And the other option for us to do go forward would be uh, by sharing your screen slide. You, you can you can okay. do that also. Okay. So just just a second. Yeah. I have record. I have share. I have that comment box, but I don't have a. Oh. Okay. Can you share your screen? I'll be my I might be able to help you with this. Yes, just a second. Yep. Okay, so you want me to share my screen, you said, no? Yeah. Do you want me to? Oh, there is a browse OneDrive option here. One second, let me just try that. Ah, okay. Just tell me if it if it uh, pops up now. Yeah, I can, can see your something on screen. Yeah, you see yeah. It? Yeah, the, the X-ray is there. Yes. Okay. You can see that. I think you're still you're you're presenting. You're using the presenter mode and presenting. It's not a screen share, isn't it? Okay. Uh, no. Yeah. So do you see just a single slide? You just see a single slide, right? I can just see a single slide. And uh, and uh, laser pointer right now? Yeah, yeah. Laser pointer is good. So okay. That sounds all right. Yeah. I think okay. yeah, yeah, good. yeah. So, so what then, should I do? I'll stop sharing. Yeah, you can stop sharing and then. Uh, then I think Jaden, you can take over, introduce, and then we'll start off. Uh, we just have only a uh, low number of people. Should we wait for some more time? Or? I, I think in the interest of uh, time and keeping uh, keeping up, we should start, yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Rural Service Bootcamp. Uh, so the as you all know, the first session had a very encouraging turnout. So uh, that was really nice, and I hope this will continue. So please spread the word to your batchmates and other doctors working in all around India as well. So as you all know, this is intended uh, for doctors working in rural India and especially for the new batch of bonders. So you know we're trying to help you with this and. Uh, you can uh, make you can help us make this better by spreading the word. So uh, today we'll be having the second session on chest X-rays, and uh, the session will be taken by Dr. Be Betsy Teresa, a clinical fellow working in the emergency department of uh, Cambridge University in UK, and uh, Dr. Clyde Menezes, uh, who's a senior resident in the Department of Radiology, St. John's. So uh, welcome, Dr. Betsy and uh, Dr. Clyde, and. Uh, and welcome to everyone. So just a few reminders before we start the session. Uh, uh, keep all your audios are muted and uh, try to keep the doubts towards the end of the session as well. And uh, also uh, we had around 60 people uh, turn up for the session last time, but we didn't have a lot of feedback forms which were filled. So that will really help us out in improving our future sessions. So kindly uh, do fill the feedback forms. It hardly takes a minute. And uh, I think that should be it. And Dr. Betsy, we can take over. That's OK. Thank you. Thank you, Chetan, for the kind introduction. Um, I think I will jump into the PowerPoint presentation right now. Uh, 
I hope my presentation is visible. Yep, good to go. Right. So um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, I think a few days ago we did a session on uh, chest x-rays. Um, before moving into the second session, I just wanted to summarize what we discussed in the earlier session. So we discussed about the different views of chest x-ray, PA views and AP views. What are the disadvantages of an AP view? We discussed about a good quality chest x-ray, about terms like magnification, depth of inspiration, and check whether the film is rotated or not, exposure of an x-ray, um, scapular position along with the potential pitfalls. Then we went on to discuss the normal anatomy, um, what to look for on a normal chest x-ray, the lung shadows, the lung markings, uh, how does a normal hyla look like, heart borders, the heart chambers forming the heart borders, and um, to check for cardiomegaly, how to calculate the CTR ratio, which is the cardiothoracic ratio. Um, then we discussed a small checklist on how to analyze a chest x-ray step by step. There were a couple of steps um, which um, entailed basically looking at each and every area of the chest x-ray systematically. Then we went on to talk about the two common disease patterns that we see, an alveolar pattern and the interstitial disease pattern. Um, and then we discussed the first clinical question from the 10 that was about pneumonia and how to find out or identify hidden pneumonias using the silhouette sign. So silhouette sign, uh, just a recap, was a blurred or a missing interface on the diaphragmatic or the heart borders, which allowed us to deduce the position or the precise position of the abnormality. Um, so the second session is about the rest of the clinical problems, so the nine clinical problems. Um, I did get some feedback regarding the first session to add on a few management um, points for the different clinical problems. So I have added them in this session. I also got some feedback regarding adding on pediatric x-rays. Unfortunately, I've not been able to do that, but I promise you there will be a session to cover pediatric x-rays and pediatric um, issues. But thank you so much for the feedback again. I do appreciate it. Moving on, um, we've got the second clinical problem. It's about whether there is a pneumothorax or not. So the main three principles when you think about a pneumothorax is that a pneumothorax should be excluded in all patients who present with pleuritic chest pains or unexplained breathlessness. Always remember that if you don't think about it, you won't find it. So always look carefully in the x-ray, otherwise you're going to miss a small pneumothorax. Also, you must know where to look for a pneumothorax and always double check the lung apices because uh, you might remember that's one of the tricky hidden areas and a pneumothorax might be hidden in there, especially small ones. So you need to look for three cardinal features to identify a pneumothorax. Like you can see in this figure, you need to identify a clearly defined line that is parallel to the chest wall that might be visible. On the upper part of the line, it's going to be slightly curved at the lung apex, so you need to look carefully at the lung apices. And definitely, there will be absence of lung markings between the lung edge and the chest wall. So these are the three features that you need to look for to identify a pneumothorax definitively. Um, so you know that the normal lungs are more opaque, slightly whiter in color on a chest x-ray. And consequently, when there is a pneumothorax, when there is air entrapment in the pleural sac, the air is black in color. And that's the reason it contrasts with the adjacent lung. And that's why it's easily visible on the chest x-ray. Um, I think I'll also take this chance to tell you about how the size of a pneumothorax is being calculated. Um, using a chest x-ray and we can use the chest x-ray to estimate, to approximate the size of a pneumothorax and that's important because the size of the pneumothorax is a parameter that will help us to guide uh, the management of a pneumothorax. So what you need to do is you need to calculate the distance between the visceral pleura 
and the internal chest wall. Now this measurement should be taken at the level of the hyla, and if this is less than two centimeter, then we classify it as a small pneumothorax. If it's more than two centimeter, it's a large one. And this is important to um, guide the management options. Betsy, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I don't think we can see your point uh, when, you, when you're pointing. Uh, could you please make sure that that's coming up? Is it visible now? It's visible now, right. Um, thank you, Alex, for that. I'm going to show you some x-rays to show you how a pneumothorax is going to look like on a chest x-ray. These are quite zoomed out, so you need to look very carefully so that you don't miss out a pneumothorax. So in the first figure, you can see the visceral pleural line right here. So, And you can see that there are no lung markings beyond that. So that is a very shallow pneumothorax that you can identify in the first one. In the second figure, again, you can notice there is a well-defined line which represents the visceral pleura. Again, you can notice that there are no lung markings beyond that line. So that those are the important features that you need to look for to identify um, a pneumothorax. You need to remember that there can be some imposters uh, a white line on the chest x-ray, it's very easy for me to say, but it can be misread as clothing artifacts, skin wrinkles, venous lines and tubing, which are very common, an overlying scapula margin maybe. And therefore, it's always important to repeat the chest x-ray um, after sort of eliminating these artifacts, if possible, um, if you have any doubt regarding the nature of the presumed lung edge. So what happens if the chest x-ray is done on a supine patient? Now, you know that in a severely injured patient, trauma patients, it's inevitably the chest x-ray is going to be done in the supine position. So what happens in the supine position is that the pleural air is going to rise to the topmost position, to the highest point in the pleural space, which is the anterior aspect of the thorax, like you can see here. And therefore, the lung base and the area around the heart would need careful evaluation to look for signs of pneumothorax. So you need to inspect two areas. So one is the lung base that you need to inspect. You need to look for three features. The first one is called a hyperlucent upper quadrant of the abdomen. That is because of the air collecting at the base of the lung, which overlies the liver. I'll show it to you in the x-ray very soon. You can also look for the deep sulcus sign. That is the air that is situated in the lateral CP angle. So if you look at the first figure, you can see both these signs very clearly here. So this is the upper quadrant of the abdomen. You can see that the upper quadrant appears to be more blacker than usual. And that's because of the air entrapped here. Again, you can see that the lateral costophrenic sulcus, which is this one here, it's very well defined um, and it's quite deep. That's called the deep sulcus sign. You also need to look for a sharp outline of the dome of the diaphragm. So if you look at the second figure, you can see that the right side of pneumothorax is being revealed by a very sharply defined margin of the dome of the diaphragm because of the air that's being collected here in the supine position. So remember to carefully look at the lung bases, both the lung bases carefully. The other area you need to carefully inspect is the medial, medial area. So the pleural air may collect anterior medially against the heart. So you need to look for two signs. You need to look for a deep and well-defined anterior cardiophrenic sulcus. So if you look at this figure here, the anterior cardiophrenic sulcus is the most medial part of the pleural space. So it lies against the inferior margin of the heart. And if this sulcus appears to be well-defined, this might be the earliest sign of a small pneumothorax. So in this figure, you can see a very well-defined um, cardiophrenic sulcus. 
The other sign you should look for is a sharply defined cardiac border, which you can see again clearly here. And also, like we discussed earlier, you can also see a sharply defined left dome of the diaphragm. So these are the signs uh, that you need to look for on a supine chest X-ray to identify a pneumothorax definitively. What happens in case of a hemoneumothorax? So many patients who have a spontaneous pneumothorax, whether primary or secondary, they'll have a little fluid in the pleural space. Now, mostly this is a, some small amount of blood that's caused by a tear of a pleural adhesion. What you can see here is an air fluid level right here. So this is basically a straight line, which is seen at the air fluid interface. So you can see the visceral line here. There is air around here, and then you've got some fluid collecting around here. So this is the hemopneumothorax. I've also put a small slide uh, just to discuss the management options. I know this looks a bit crowded, but I'm just going to briefly touch upon the basic principles regarding management of a pneumothorax. Um, you need to remember that management is dependent on whether the pneumothorax is a spontaneous, primary spontaneous pneumothorax or a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. So patients with pre-existing lung disease would, would predispose them to get a pneumothorax and that's what's called a secondary pneumothorax. And it's important to distinguish this, make this diagnosis early on to guide appropriate management. You need to remember that people with secondary pneumothorax tolerated less well as compared to somebody who's having a primary pneumothorax. So if when we've diagnosed a spontaneous pneumothorax, check if the patient is hemodynamically stable or not. If the patient is unstable, directly go ahead and proceed with a chest drain. Um, if the patient is stable, you decide whether this is primary or a secondary pneumothorax. The rest of the management will depend on the size of the pneumothorax and whether the patient is clinically significantly breathless or not. So breathlessness is an indication for an active intervention. You cannot simply manage the patient conservatively. Let's go and discuss secondary pneumothorax first. So if it's a large pneumothorax and the patient is breathless, go for a chest drain insertion. If the size is about one to two centimeter, you can try needle aspiration. If that's not successful, go for a chest drain insertion. But you need to remember that all patients with a secondary pneumothorax need to be ideally admitted and observed for at least 24 hours. In case of a primary pneumothorax, if it's a large one um, and if the patient is quite breathless, you need to try needle aspiration. If that's successful, well and good, consider discharge. If it's not, you need to consider a chest drain insertion. So that's about briefly about the management of um, pneumothorax. Moving on to another important clinical question about signs of left ventricular failure. Um, there are a few things that you can identify in the x-ray which might um, point towards an LVF. So you need to look for cardiac enlargement and for lung and pleural changes. Now we all know how to calculate um, how to check for cardiac enlargement. You just need to calculate the CTR ratio. If that's more than 50%, there's likely cardiac enlargement. But there are some caveats. The first one is about an AP chest X-ray. So we've discussed this earlier that the AP chest X-ray, because of the radiographic technique, the heart might seem to be spuriously enlarged. Again, a depressed sternum, it'll push the contents laterally, which might make it seem like cardiac enlargement, so you need to be careful about that. The other thing is 2% of the population might have a normal CTR of more than 50%. So you need to be careful in these cases and make sure you compare with the previous chest X-ray if available. So that'll be able to make it more obvious whether there is an heart enlargement or not. Um, the other problem is that the other way around, um, normally, um, there might be some people with very, very narrow tubular hearts. So the transverse cardiac di diameter is going to be very, very narrow. And if the heart, heart is enlarged, it may not even reach 50%. Um, and, you know, they might even have a normal CTR, even though the heart is enlarged. Again, in this scenario, you need to make sure that you compare with the previous chest X-ray available. Otherwise, it's very difficult to say.
So what are these signs that you need to look for on the chest X-ray? You've got some early signs and some late signs. So early signs we've discussed about an enlarged heart. There might be some edema, which is caused by um, perivascular edema that's caused by the that's caused by heart failure itself, which will cause poorly defined margins of the hyla vessels. There might be septal lines and bilateral small pleural effusions. Later signs is more of an interstitial shadowing, alveolar shadowing, and larger pleural effusions. So you might remember that a pulmonary edema, it came under both the alveolar disease pattern and the interstitial disease pattern when we discussed in the first session. Um, I'll show you a few x-rays to understand what these signs are in a bit more detail. So in the first figure, these are the curly B lines that you can see, it's the septal lines. It's caused by fluid in the interstitium. So these are short straight lines which reach the pleural surface and they have this characteristic appearance, especially at the CP angles. So this is a sign of an early LVF. This is perivascular edema. This is the poorly defined margins of the hyla vessels that you can see because of the fluid around it. Here you can see blunting of both the CP angles. It's caused by small pleural effusions. And you need to remember that in LVF, most of the times the effusions are bilateral. Later signs include interstitial edema. You can see the characteristic interstitial disease pattern where the fluid mainly lies in the interstitium of the lung and um, the shadowing is pro pro predominantly you, the reticular nodular pattern that you see. When there is alveolar edema, the fluid mainly lies within the alveolar air spaces, predominantly rather than the interstitium, and therefore the shadows look like the classical um, cotton wool or the fluffy appearance. So this is an alveolar pattern like disease. So these are the later signs that you see in LVF. Moving on to management of acute LVF, first line is IV diuretics, it's furosemide or bumetanide. Um, you need to give oxygen, make sure target SATs of 94 to 98%. Do not routinely offer opiates or nitrates. So IV nitrates are usually only indicated if patient has um, hypertension, if, they, if they've got a valvular disease, if they've got concomitant myocardial ischemia, then you need to give IV nitrates as well. But you need to be very, very careful. It has a major side effect of causing hypotension. So you need to monitor the blood pressure very closely. And I think ideally this should be done in an ICU setting. Obviously, if you're going on to start IV nitrates, you need to involve your seniors. And if you don't have the resources, you need to refer the patient on. If the patient is in shock, you, need, you might need to consider inotropes or vasopressors like dobutamine or adrenaline. If the patient is not responding, patient is severely dyspneic and acidemic, you might need to consider non-invasive ventilation. And if that's not working, maybe even invasive ventilation. This is an interesting clinical question about asthmatic attack, about the complications of an asthmatic attack. Um, you might think that there might not be anything visible on, on a chest x-ray for a patient who comes in with an asthmatic attack. And th that is mostly true because in 95% of patients, the chest x-ray would be normal. Um, in some patients, it might demonstrate signs of hyperinflation um, with the flattening of the domes of the diaphragm because of air trapping. But when is actually a, a chest x-ray useful? It's mainly used when the diagnosis of asthma is equivocal to rule out the other causes for dyspnea. It can also help us to identify few complications that occur with a severe asthmatic attack. So if the patient has associated pleuritic pain, there might be an underlying pneumothorax or a pneumomediastinum. If the patient is pyrexic, there might be a pneumonic consolidation, which might be inducing or even increasing the asthmatic symptoms. So an extra will be helpful to look for these. Um, also, if there is an unexpected deterioration of the patient, um, there might be an underlying lobar collapse that's caused by mucus plugging in asthma asthmatic patients especially. So that's another thing that you can look for on a chest x-ray. 
Um, what can you see on a chest X-ray in a patient with lobar collapse? So the affected lung lobe is usually white with signs of volume loss. Now, why is that? The whiteness of the lung is mainly because the affected lung lung tissue has lost its volume. It's, it occupies a smaller space. Also, it has no air within it. Therefore, it appears to be more whiter. Also, you've got mucus secretions collecting up in the alveoli, which makes it seem more whiter. You can also see signs of volume loss, like a displacement of the horizontal fissure, high limb trachea, mediastinum displacement, elevation of the diaphragm, decreased spacing between ribs, which shows that the, there, there is a loss of volume. Now, to compensate this, there might be evidence of hyperinflation of the adjacent unaffected lobe. So the adjacent lobe might appear to be more blacker. Um, let me show you some pictures to make this more clear to you. Right. So in the first image, you can see the shadow in the right upper lobe. So this is being caused by a collapse of the right upper lobe. And this is because this is the horizontal fissure that is supposed to be sitting around here, but it has moved superiorly. You've also got an elevated right hilum, and the collapsed lung appears to be more whiter and more dense. So those are the things that you need to look for. When you look at the second picture, if you look carefully, you can si see the white line here, the white visceral line, and the absence of lung markings beyond that. So there is an apical pneumothorax. That's one of the recognized complications of severe asthma. We know that pneumomediastinum is also a known complication for asthma. Now, how do you recognize a pneumomediastinum? The most common cause is a rupture of an alveoli, especially in asthmatic patients, mechanical ventilation, underwater diving, young patients who smoke cocaine. It could be sometimes spontaneous as well. Other causes like esophageal rupture, thoracic trauma are also common. So what happens when an alveoli ruptures? So when an alveoli ruptures, the air will dissect along the vascular bundles and will reach the root of the lung. And from the lung root, the air will enter the mediastinal soft tissues. So this would lead to, or this would cause a pneumomediastinum. So there are some things that you can, some features that you need to look for to identify, to identify one. First one is the continuous diaphragm sign. So what does that mean? Um, normally, the central part of the diaphragm is not very visualized on a frontal chest X-ray because it is not in contact with lungs but the mediastinal gas can dissect along this plane. And that's the reason why the entire diaphragm might be visible. If you look at the second figure, you can clearly see the continuous diaphragm sign where the inferior part, where the central part of the diaphragm um, is made visible by the air dissecting. The second feature is a black halo surrounding the heart. So this is because of air elevating the mediastinal pleura away from the heart. So the first figure clearly depicts that. If you look carefully, you can see the black halo, this black streak of air that is surrounding the heart. So that's another feature that you need to look for. Also, you also need to look for streaks of gas in the neck or in the soft tissues of the chest wall. So that's another feature. In the first diagram, you can see some air being entrapped in the soft tissues of the neck. So that's what we, that's what we call subcutaneous emphysema. So the, that's one of the other feature that you need to look for. Mm, moving on to treatment of acute asthma, you might be very well aware that you need to give oxygen, make sure that the target oxygen levels are 94 to 98%. Need to give beta 2 agonists, that's salbutamol and terbutalin. Repeat these doses if there is an inadequate response at 15 to 30 minute intervals. Also give steroids early on, either orally or parenterally. 
until here, I think you can manage by yourself. But if if you need repeated doses of bronchodilators, if the patient is not responding well to the initial treatment, you might have to involve your seniors. Um, Ipratropin bromide is another drug that you can add in patients having severe or life-threatening features with poor response to beta-2 agonists. Um, lastly, you might have to consider IV magnesium sulfate or IV aminophilin. These are drugs that are used in patients having life-threatening features with very poor response to inhaled bronchodilators. And definitely, you need to involve your senior staff before you administer any of these drugs. You normally don't give antibiotics in cases of acute asthma. It's only given um, if we think that there is an underlying pneumonia that might be triggering um, the asthma. Moving on to another clinical question regarding pleural effusions. Now, it requires at least 200 to 300 mils of pleural fluid to efface this, efface the normal recess that's present in between the diaphragm and the ribs. Now, it can adopt several different appearances. On an erect chest x-ray, if you look at it, you can see this opaque meniscus at the CP angle, and that's the sign that you need to look for to identify a pleural effusion. So the meniscus sign um, is might might be might might help you to identify a pleural effusion. If there is a larger effusion, again you can see an opaque hemithorax with the meniscus sign in figure B. If there is a, a very large effusion, then there'll be an opaque hemithorax with shifting of the mediastinum to the opposite side. And um, if the effusion is really large, if it's about five to seven liters or even more, this might be the picture that you get. Now, there are other patterns as well, like lamellar and cysted and subpulmonary effusions. We will talk about that in the coming slides. So in the first figure, you can see a lamellar pleural effusion. So th this is a linear um, effusion that's parallel to the lateral aspect of the lung. So there's collection of fluid parallel to the chest wall. Insisted pleural effusion is when the fluid is loculated within a horizontal fissure or elsewhere. That's when we call it insisted uh, pleural effusion. This is again uh, another chest x-ray to see you, to show you the different patterns of pleural effusion. On the first figure, you can see there's a small effusion on the patient's right side. You can see the meniscus sign quite clearly. And if you look at the left side, there is a larger pleural effusion, again, with the meniscus sign. The rest of the chest x-ray, it basically shows alveolar interstitial disease pattern. Um, and um, this was a patient who presented with pulmonary edema and the bilateral effusions are because of that. In the second figure, you can clearly see the insisted pleural fluid in the horizontal fissure. So that's another pattern for fluid to collect. Another pattern is the subpulmonary effusion. So like the term says, there is pooling of the pleural fluid below the lung. In the first figure, there is a pulmonary effusion below the right side of the lung. There's a subpulmonary effusion on the right side. Um, I know it's very difficult to say, but there is a helpful characteristic which will help us to identify whether there is a subpulmonic effusion or not. So Normally, the highest point on a normal diaphragm dome is invariably central. However, when there is a subpulmonary effusion, the highest point of the dome will be situated more laterally. So this is a helpful, helpful method to identify uh, a subpulmonary effusion. If you look at the X-ray on the right side, there is a subpulmonary effusion on the left side. Now it looks, it's it's very difficult to say whether that's actually fluid or whether that, that's the dome of the diaphragm. So how do you identify that? So there is fluid collection between the visceral and the parietal pleura at the base of the lung. 
and that would stimulate, sorry, simulate um, an elevated diaphragmatic dome. Now, what happens is that because of the fluid, it displaces the gastric air bubble away from the superior margin of the apparent diaphragmatic dome. So normally this distance is around seven millimeter, but if it's more than that, then it's likely uh, that there is an effusion on the lung base here. Also, you can see, like we discussed um, for the right side, the dome of the diaphragm, the highest point, would be situated more laterally as compared to the normal dome. So that's about um, the different patterns of pleural effusions that you can see. What happens if the X-ray is done in a supine position? What happens to the fluid? So the fluid will then spread to the most dependent site, which is the posterior aspect of the pleural space. And what happens is that the entire right hemothorax will appear grayer or whiter than the usual, than the opposite side. So if you look at this figure, you've got, if this was done in a supine position and you've got uh, the right hemithorax appearing more grayer or whiter than the opposite side. Um, you, in most instances, you will be able to see some markings of the hyla vessels. Sometimes when there is a massive collection of pleural fluid, um, we often call it a whiteout lung, that can be caused by a large collection of pleural fluid. Um, that that might be present when there is about five to seven litres of pleural fluid um, in the sac. The treatment for pleural effusions, um, quite simple actually. Basically, you need to give oxygen, maintain target levels of 94 to 98%. The rest of the management will depend on the cause for the effusion. So if it's congestive heart failure, like we discussed, you need to give diuretics. If an infective cause is suspected, you need to give empirical IV antibiotics. If the patient is still clinically deteriorating or the fluids, fluid is accumulating despite antibiotics, we might have to consider thoracocentesis. Again, if it's a malignant effusion, depending on the performance status of the patient, if the patient has got very limited lifespan, is terminally ill, then you might have to go for therapeutic thoracocentesis. That's mainly for symptomatic relief. But if they've got a good performance status, then the first line would be pleurodesis or pleural catheter. So pleurodesis is when you administer a few substances like talc to cause inflammatory changes in the pleural sac, which will cause the fusion of the visceral and the parietal pleura and obliterate that space. You can also you know, give a plural catheter to help with the continuous drainage of the fluid. So that's the management for malignant patients. You can also consider chest physiotherapy um, that will help with improving the symptoms of the patient and the chest x-ray appearance. Coming to the next clinical question, whether there is an aortic dis dissection, whether there is a traumatic rupture of the aorta. Very important questions to ask. Um, we know that the normal mediastinum is formed by the cardiac outline. You've got the thoracic aorta, the superior vena cava, and the aortic arch. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any absolute measurements to assess the mediastinum. We always need to compare present x-ray with any previous chest x-ray if available, and any changes to the mediastinum will then become obvious. So in case of an aortic dissection, it's often a normal chest x-ray. You can see mediastinal widening, plus or minus, and left side. That might be because the aorta might have ruptured into the pleural sac that, that's causing the effusion. Again, that's not the important point to remember. It's always clinical suspicion must take priority over a normal chest x-ray and you need to do additional imaging in all cases if you're suspecting an aortic dissection. This is a slide just to show you the management of the different types of aortic dissection. So we've got Stanford type A and type B roughly. Type A 
mainly involves the ascending aorta and type B is mainly involving the descending aorta. Type A hands down would require surgical management and would require rigorous BP blood pressure control. Type B is usually managed conservatively. You might need to give IV antihypertensives to decrease the blood pressure and reduce the progression of the dissection. Again, I don't think this can be managed in a primary centre. This needs to be referred on to a tertiary centre. And the patients need to be closely monitored. How do you identify a traumatic rupture of the aorta? So again, chest x-ray is really not a very good investigation to identify that because 30% of the times patients will have normal chest x-ray. And even if the patient is not, if the chest x-ray is normal, rely on clinical suspicion. You might need to do additional imaging to confirm your findings. Um, also, if you identify a widened mediastinum, um, it's most commonly caused following trauma and it's due to tearing of the small mediastinal veins as opposed to a, a traumatic rupture of the aorta. And tearing of the small mediastinal veins is very, very common. And therefore, a mediastinal enlargement does not necessarily indicate that there's an aortic rupture. So always, always ha have, the have a clinical suspicion in the back of your mind first, and then you might need to consider additional imaging based on the clinical scenario. And there are some pitfalls. The middle-aged and the elderly patients will have something, a phenomenon called as age-related unfolding of the aorta. So the aorta will just unfold, which will cause a slight enlargement of the mediastinum. And um, how do we know whether the mediastinal enlargement is being caused by the normal age-related unfolding of the aorta or whether this is a dissection. Again, first thing is to compare with the previous chest x-ray if one is available and definitely a combination of the clinical history and the examination and the chest x-ray analysis will almost all the time will reassure and remove any worries. So always correlate the chest x-ray clinically before you make a diagnosis. The other pitfall is regarding AP chest x-rays, like we discussed, there might be spurious mediastinal enlargement, spurious heart enlargement and magnification. So that's because of the radiographic technique. So you need to be careful while interpreting an AP chest x-ray as well. Right. So is there a rib fracture or not? So this is a common question that we get about while assessing chest x-rays. Now, clinical management is very rarely altered by a simple rib fracture. Mostly chest x-rays are done to rule out pneumothorax rather than diagnosing rib fractures. And it's got some pitfalls as well because a fracture through the costal cartilage is not very evident, mainly because cartilage is radiolucent. And a fracture through a rib may not be detectable unless it's displaced and most of the fractures are initially undisplaced. So it's not a very good investigation there. Management is analgesia, analgesia, analgesia. Give chest physiotherapy, give oxygen if needed, and then treat the underlying cause. So what I mean by saying underlying cause is that if you're suspecting a pathological fracture due to metastasis, then you need to refer to the appropriate specialty. If you're thinking osteoporosis, that needs to be evaluated. If you're thinking these rib fractures are caused by a fall, especially in the elderly, you might have to evaluate the reason, the cause for the fall, especially in the elderly. Right. So I've got an x-ray of a female, 35-year-old, who was drunk and inebriated. He was complaining, she was complaining of chest pain. Is anybody able to identify the problem here? Um, anybody happy to speak up? Feel is that free a new to... Yeah, go on. Is that a pneumothorax? I'm not, I don't um, know. I'm just... <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Pop in. That's all right. Um, where exactly... Is it the left side or the right side that we're talking about? Uh, 
uh, on a second close look no i don't see any i was worried about the left side uh, mm-hmm. but i think i must have been mistaken because yeah, because you can see the vascular markings around there not sure yeah that's what i put the side is correct um and if you look carefully you can see that these ribs are broken um you can see the clearly displaced rib fractures on the left side the multiple multiple rib fractures that explains the cause of chest pain in this patient right um sometimes we do chest x-rays for patients who come in with non specific chest pains and in most of these patients they'll have a normal chest x-ray uh, but if you systematically analyze the chest x-ray you might be able to find out other causes like a pneumothorax or spontaneous pneumo mediastinum rib fractures etc i've got a few interesting x-rays to show you again all of these patients came in with chest pain um but it was very non specific so in the first one you've got a female 38 years old who's coming in with chest pain if you go with the systematic analysis of the chest x-ray you analyze it carefully you'll be able to see that the left cardiac border is effaced it's quite blurred as compared to the right side so this is our very own silhouette sign being positive which means that there is a consolidation in the left upper lobe in the second figure this is again a male patient 54 year old coming in with chest pain it was very difficult to localize the chest pain so we did a chest x-ray only to get that sort of a chest x-ray um is anybody able to tell me what's wrong with that it is a difficult one anyways let me tell you the answer so if you look carefully you can see diaphragm borders very clear and you've got air under both the diaphragms so this was a case of a perforated duodenal ulcer that um that he was complaining of chest pain here you've got a few other patients who came in with non specific chest pains first one young male recent vomiting episode complaining of chest pain i've i've shown the arrows here there was a, a pneumo mediastinum you can see a halo around the heart right around here um and this was caused by an esophageal rupture because of the recent episode of vomiting in this one you've got a male patient presenting with acute tearing chest pain it it is quite difficult to say but there was mediastinal enlargement and this was actually a type a aortic dissection which needed to be surgically managed so the bottom line is you need to analyze the chest x-ray step by step look at it carefully uh, and make sure you always have the clinical question at the back of your head yeah um moving on to the second last clinical question is there an evidence of a pulmonary embolus so 90% of the chest x-rays will occur 90% of the chest x-rays with the pe will occur without a pulmonary infarction 10% will show features of pulmonary infarction in fact the major role of a chest x-ray in a pe is not to diagnose pe but to exclude other conditions that can mimic a pe like pneumothorax rib fractures pneumonia and if you see few of the other features it's just to add on to or support your diagnosis whenever you suspect a pe whatever the chest x-ray findings are the patient will require a definitive imaging like a ct pa now if that's not available you'll have to refer on to an appropriate center where these facilities are available you can also see other non specific signs in the chest x-ray like small areas of collapse or consolidation small effusions slight elevation of the dome of the diaphragm let me repeat they all very non specific signs um and you need a definitive di- definitive investigation to make sure to diagnose a pe briefly touching on uh, the management of a suspected pe 
you need to calculate the VELS score first. If the VELS score is more than four points, PE is very likely. You need to arrange for an immediate CTPA, or if the CTP is going to be delayed, you need to start on therapeutic anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin. If the CTP is positive, you've confirmed a PE and you need to continue the anticoagulation. If the CTPA is negative, then you need to make up your mind regarding a suspicion for a DVT. If you're suspecting a DVT, then you need to consider a venous ultrasound scan. And if it's not suspected, we're almost sure that there is no PE and we need to look for another diagnosis. If the well score is less than four points, if PE is very unlikely, start with a D-dimer test. If the results are going to be available within four hours, then just wait for the D-dimer test to come back. And if it doesn't, start therapeutic anticoagulation. Again, if D-dimer is positive, you need to go ahead and do a CTPA. If the D-dimer is negative, you need to stop anticoagulation and look for another diagnosis. So this is just a brief approach on how to manage a suspected PE. So this is the last clinical question about any evidence of an inhaled foreign body. Um, what are the possible findings in the chest x-ray? You might find obstructive atelectasis, which is areas of collapse or consolidation. You can see obstructive emphysema, which is a hypertransradiant lung because of air trapping. So the affected lung will appear more blacker than the opposite side because of air trapping. Sometimes it'll just look normal, but if you've got a high clinical suspicion, then you might have to do a bronchoscopy to confirm or refute the refute your suspicion. We've got a child here who came in with suspicion of inhaling a foreign body. Um, if you look at the x-ray carefully, the right lung appears to be much blacker as compared to the left. So the right lung was hypertransradiant. Uh, and that's because of obstructive emphysema, because of the air that's being trapped um, in the lungs. And you need to remember that food particles, especially organic food like peanuts, etc., will not be visualized in the chest X-ray. So these subtle findings, they're very important. You need to look for them uh, and you need to know where to look for them and make sure you don't miss out on an important diagnosis. So coming to the end of my session. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, we have got a few other interesting cases by Dr. Clyde. Um, it's to discuss some clinical scenarios and some applications that we discussed today. Um, hope it's going to be really helpful and useful for you. Uh, over to you, Dr. Clyde. I'm going to stop presenting now. We'll take questions at the end of that. Yep. Thank you, Betsy. That was a lovely uh, presentation. Thanks for recapping um, a lot of a lot of important points. My cases are not um, interesting by any means, but I hope um, they reiterate all that you've learned today and in the last session. Uh, what I do now is I'll show you a few images. I think there are about ten. You will, um, you know, keep it in mind or just write down on a piece of paper what you think the diagnosis is likely to be. Or if there's a question, you know, follow accordingly. And we'll discuss it at the end. I'm not going to call anyone out and ask you for an answer, so don't worry. This is just uh, a post test of sorts, if nothing else. I'll give you 30 seconds before I change the slide, and that should work. Can all of you see the image on screen? Yep, I got a thumbs up, so I'm going to start my timer now. We'll get about 30 seconds for this one. This individual presented with history of contact with tuberculosis. Now has breathlessness. That's the only relevant history you have.
The next individual, young male, presented with a sore throat, cough, and some blood streaking in sputum in the morning. This individual is a uh, 20s something male and had an acute onset of right sided chest pain. No other significant history. You can write down diagnoses or you can write down the relevant clinical finding, radiological finding. Elderly lady, breathlessness and a wet cough. Sixty-five year old with a long-standing history of smoking, currently has fever and a dry cough. fever, and a pricking pain in the left side of the chest on deep inspiration. A short history, less than one week. What is the best further line of management for this individual? Relevant history is that they've come to your bond center with a history of trauma one week ago. Admitted at another hospital. Don't have any details and have now come to you breathless with chest pain. Do you want to put in a right-sided ICD, a left-sided intercostal drain, start the individual on IV antibiotics, refer the patient, or wait and watch. Say a little prayer. This chap had a fall four days ago. Was said to have no relevant radiological findings, but presented to you with right sided chest pain. No history provided for this exit.
रूटीन हेल्थ चेकअप नो नॉन कोमोबिलिटीज नो कंप्लेन्स All right. So if you're ready, what do you think has happened here? What I'd like you all to do is, when you look at an X-ray, keep a performer always in mind. So Betsy has given us what you would look at, how you would assess for inspiration, its depth, rotation, exposure, all of them. So you have the X-ray. You can't control all of them because unless you take the X-ray yourself, the technician is going to do that whole job for you. What you need to do is when you have an X-ray, either on your computer or film in hand, uh, follow a set performer. So what I like, what I usually do is if I see a pathology, I leave it for the end. What is a very documented phenomenon with radiologists and clinicians is when you find a positive finding, you may miss other things elsewhere. And this phenomenon is called search satisfaction. Don't be, you know, don't fall prey to that thing. Just keep in mind that when you see a pathology, keep it for the end because, you know, you've already seen it. You aren't going to miss it. Look at all the other things. So when looking at a chest, what's probably least important? The abdomen. So start with the abdomen, either in the left hypochondrial region or the right hypochondrial region. Scan the entire visualized abdomen. All right. Once you've done that, that's the A. Look at the thorax. Okay. Look at the thoracic cage. Look at each of the ribs if you want, posteriorly or anterior and anteriorly on one side and then on the other. Look at the scapula, look at the humerus if you can see it, the clavicle, spinous processes, move to the other clavicle, the scapula and the humerus and you're done with the thoracic cage and all the bones if you please. Once you've done the T, look at the mediastinum. So come back, look at the trachea, is it central? Look at the heart, look for mediastinal widening, the aortic knuckle, calcifications or unfolding of the um, aorta. Maybe I'll switch to this. I hope you can see it. Uh, once you've finished the media standing, look at the lungs. Start at the apices or start at the bases. It doesn't really matter, but always follow a particular order. So what you could do is if you land up at the base, start from the right CP angle or the left CP angle, whatever handed system you prefer. Work your way up that lung, scanning from one side to the other. Switch to the opposite. Once you've gone top to bottom, go and the top or vice versa. Once you finish scanning both the lungs, a quick run through by compar comparing the same area on both sides. So if you look at this X-ray, all the ribs are symmetrical. Expansion of the lung is good. Rotation is minimal. There is a little bit, but we'll ignore that. So what if this lung has expanded? You could compare each side because it, it is it would have been a well taken X-ray. You've done this for the right side. Because the left, uh, sorry, the left side, because you know that the right side has a problem. You found that the right, the left lung looks fairly all right. The heart and whatever you can see looks okay. We'll ascribe a little bit of, you know, deviation of the media stand into the left due to rotation if there was it. Now, what is this thing that you see here? You barely see any lung. It looks very opaque or white. You don't see the diaphragmatic outline. You can't really tell where the liver is, where the flu, you know, what where this white stuff is. It's probably fluid. You can see a breast shadow here, but that's you know, just a breast shadow. And you can see some lucent areas, which are you know a little hazy, not very well opacified. Uh, sorry, not very well aerated in the top portion of the right hemithorax. What you would ascribe this finding to is a large right pleural effusion. Okay. Now, uh, I said a history of contact with TB to give you a little context because that's something we see very often here. And the patient can be asymptomatic, just, you know, developing a pleural effusion over time until it becomes large enough to either displace the media stand into the contralateral side or get secondarily infected and lead to other problems. What you see here is the residual compressed right limb. It's all collapsed onto the, you know, close to the hilum. That's why it appears hazy. And there is a little bit of residual aeration. All right. If you hadn't seen this, if this was not there, this entire thing was white, that's what you call a white out lung. 
Okay, and if it was because of such a large fluid diffusion as that, it would displace the media stinum a little bit to the opposite side. All right. Once you found that there is a pleural effusion, either blind or under ultrasound guidance, you can introduce a drainage catheter into that hemithorax. And what you would see here is this catheter. If anyone of you knows the name, bonus points, this is a pigtailed catheter or a drainage catheter that's put into the intercostal space into the pleural cavity and it has drained out the fluid and helped in re-expansion of the lung. Okay, so you remove the fluid, the lung re-expands, but not completely. You still can't see a sharp CP angle on the right as you can on the left, but there is some aeration in the basal segments and the lower lobes also. All right. So throat, a little bit of uh, blood tinge, sputum, and a cough. Start with the abdomen. You can actually see the entirety of the liver over here. You can see the splenic shadow here. You can see some of the abdominal wall musculature. This is seemingly, you know, a healthy um, young adult. You start in the abdomen. You don't see anything abnormal here. You look at the thorax. So we we'll start with the ribs. You look at all the posterior ribs. Look at the anterior ribs on the right side. Okay. Look at the posterior ribs. Look at the anterior ribs, ribs on the left side. Look at the left scapula. Look at the right scapula. Whatever parts of the right humerus, whatever you can see of the left humerus. Clavicle on the left, clavicle on the right. Spinous processes and vertebral bodies, as many as you can see. All right. You haven't found anything yet. Start with the lungs. He has a cough, has some blood tension. That's where you expect your pathology to be. Start at the sharp right CP angle here. Work your way up. Just follow the X ray all the way up to the apex of the right lung. Switch to the left side, follow it down. Now you can see that all the ribs are you know, nicely symmetrical. This is not rotated. Clavicles are you know, well positioned. Start comparing both lungs. Have you found anything yet? I hope you haven't. This is a normal chest X-ray. Okay. The sore throat could have you know, resulted in a lot of coughing while expectorating whatever sputum might have been there, he would have, you know, lacerated a little mucosa in the pharynx or the oropharynx, nasopharynx, and brought out a little bit of, you know, blood and sputum. Alex has put his hand up. Yes, Alex. Uh, Clyde, I can't see your yeah. slide uh, changing. So it's still the pleural effusion slide. Uh, could you please uh, recheck it's it? It's still the pleural effusion slide. Just a minute, because okay. it's changing for me. I am on... It has changed for me. Oh, wait a sec. Okay. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Is, is that changing? Right? Uh, so is it changing? Yes, no. yes. Okay, is it changing for everyone or is it just me who has the problem? I, I, I'll change it. I'll change it now. Yeah. For everyone is changing, yeah. Okay, then it should be just me. Okay, no problem then. Okay. Uh, go so, yeah. so if we're all on the same page, we're still with this radiograph, which is deemed to be normal. OK, so I'm going to change my slide now. If it changes for you, Alex, and I hope that it does. Otherwise, let me know. OK. So I'm on this one. Young male came with a history of right sided chest pain. I am still on the first slide. Uh, some trouble with my You're end. still I on the uh, first slide. Um, I, I, OK, I can I, see I, Betsy. Betsy, can you give me a thumbs up if we're on the same slide? You're muted, Betsy, you're on mute. Sorry, it's not changing for me as well. I'm still on the okay. pro effusion slide. Okay. And no one said anything. Anyone else okay. has the same but, trouble? No, uh, but students are uh, changing, but I don't know if there is a problem. Uh, Clyde, can you... I can see every yeah. slide is changing, yeah. Okay, for if 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 it's working for everybody else, I think we can just continue. Uh, if not, I'll just uh, I, I'll leave and rejoin. Uh, yeah, okay. for me, I have a I have an option to navigate forward here, so I think I'll be able to see. Uh, it's okay, you guys continue. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so we're at this slide again. We we'll quickly go over the abdomen. You can see a nice funding gas shadow here. You can't see any other abnormality in the abdomen. You start with the lung bases. You know that there's something up here. 
this doesn't look very normal to you. So leave this lung for the time being. Go to the opposite lung. Start at the left CP angle. Work your way up. You don't really find anything here. Come back down. You come here and you notice that there's an abnormality here. You see a sharp, fairly well-defined lung margin. Beyond this margin, you can't see any markings, any vascular markings. Remember, these are not bronchovascular markings anymore. These are just called vascular markings because the segmental and subsegmental bronchi are not seen against, you know, on the background of an aerated lung. And where there's no lung, there are no markings. This is just air. So this is actually a spontaneous pleural effusion. And a significant past history would be that this individual had a similar complaint one month ago. He was seated, he was discharged, and now he came in with the same complaint, which was a right-sided spontaneous pleural effusion. So now what you could do is introduce this little thing. It's not a little by any means. It is an ICD placed on the right side. All right. And what you would notice immediately is that this lung is re-expanded. If you go back to the previous slide, you can't see any lung markings in this area. What you can see now is that there are some lung markings here. What is important to note is that this is not entirely re-expanded. The lung has not refilled the right hemithorax. There are still areas where there is a residual pneumothorax. What you see here in this zoomed out version is that if you follow the yellow line, you will see that that is the visceral or the collapsed lung margin, visceral pleura, if you please. And anything outside of that in this case is still air within the pleural cavity. So if you look at this space here, you can see that there are markings, vascular predominantly. And if you look at this space here, nice and clear between the two ribs, you cannot see any vascular markings there. So this is partial re-expansion, not complete. So when this line disappears, you can follow that. This is the lung margin, all right? Okay, what was this one? Elderly lady who came with breathlessness and a wet cough. So if you start in the abdomen, there's nothing really significant. If you look at the thoracic wall from whatever you see, again, nothing very significant. What the scapula there, what the humerus, you know, the proximal parts of them, you can see them. Uh, you can see both clavicles. There is a little bit of rotation. And what you would appreciate is that this is not an erect X-ray. This is a super X-ray. All right. You can see that there is an asymmetry in the scapular position. This is, you know, it just favors you know, what we what we want to see, but it's not entirely um, intentional. When you come to the media stand, what do you notice here? Does the heart look normal? I'll go back for context. Does the heart look normal? So I'll tell you this is a normal heart. What does this chap look like? Is it enlarged on both sides, one side? Do you think there's a ventricular pattern? Do you think there's an atrial enlargement? Or does this resemble something that you don't really see nowadays? So this is actually maybe cardiomegaly, yes, but the cardiac silhouette is enlarged. It has a leather water bottle appearance, okay? So this is something you see in a pericardial effusion, all right? What you, you've seen here is a pericardial effusion causing this leather bottle appearance of the heart. You don't actually know where the heart is. It's somewhere inside here, but the pericardial space is filled with fluid and hence the expansion in this side and in this side and on this side. Okay, but that's not all there is here. What are you noticing in the lung fields? That's why I kept them for the end. Are they clear lung fields? Not really. Is there air somewhere? Not really. You can see markings extending all the way to the periphery, vascular markings. But what you would notice is it's a rather fine finding, especially in, um, you know, a PPT like this shared online, is that there is septal thickening and there are inhomogeneous opacities in the alveola or the air spaces. Let's see you're nodding very enthusiastically. Can you see? Has the slide changed for you? It has? Okay, okay. I'll take, I'll take your word for it. You're still on mute. All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead then. Yeah, it's working, it's working. Okay, okay, shoot. I hope that's the same for Alex as well. Anyway, so what's happened here is you have a restriction or some form of obstruction to cardiac function. The heart has failed. When the heart is failed, what tends to happen is there is an increased back pressure. 
So if you would assume that the left ventricle has failed, what fills the left ventricle? The left atrium. Where does blood come into the left atrium from? The pulmonary circulation. How does blood land up in the pulmonary circulation? From the pulmonary artery, which comes from the right ventricle, which is filled by the right atrium, which receives blood from the systemic circulation. All right. So systemic, SVC, IVC into the right atrium, right atrium into the right ventricle, right ventricle into the lungs, from the lungs back into the left atrium and oxygenate the blood from the left ventricle, shooting back out all across the body. Left ventricle now has failed. Back pressure increases on the left atrium. Left atrium is the drainage point for the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins, you know, start in the interstitium of the lung. All right. They don't mimic the course of the airway. That is a property of the pulmonary arterial circulation. The veins run in the interstitium. When the veins become edematous, you tend to get interstitial edema. All right. When the interstitial edema has become significant, fluid starts spilling over into water, into the alveolar air spaces. All right. Once you get alveolar edema, you get fluffy opacities all across the lung. OK, in a more significant you know, form, this is called a battering appearance. All right. So you have a leather water bottle sign here. All right. This is because of a pericardial effusion. You also have pulmonary edema. Fine. This elderly gentleman who came with a history of smoking, he had some coffee, some fever. What do you immediately note about the lungs? Are they inflated? Yes. Are they overinflated? How do you know? You will count between anywhere between five and seven anterior ribs intersecting the dome of the right hand diaphragm or nothing more than 10 posterior ribs. So if you were to count with me, this is one. This is the right first anterior rib. This is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and nine. All right. And almost the 11th rib posteriorly has already been exceeded over here. This is the 12th, 12th side of the body. Okay, it's a floating rib. Someone said something? Does someone have a doubt? Um, I just wanted to interrupt. Uh, I think my slide yes. is still at the pericardial effusion. I'm not sure if has it if it has changed for the others. Okay, oh, if yes, it hasn't changed. changed for anyone else? It's changed, it's changed now. Yeah. All right. All right, I'm sorry about the trouble. Okay, so if you go on, you've seen that there are more than seven anterior ribs, more than 10 posterior ribs. What has happened to the diaphragm? Does it look like it's a normal dome shaped configuration or does it look flattened? This is a flattened hemidiaphragm. This is not even that well seen on the left. A flattened hemidiaphragm excessive, you know, inflation of the lung. This is a hyperinflated lung. The man had COPD. You will also note that there is a very tubular configuration to his heart. And if you were to examine him, he might have a barrel chest. Now, what could have happened is there could be an infective exacerbation of the COPD, and that's why he's presented to you with cough and fever. Another indecision with pleuritic chest pain on the left side, a fever and some cough. What you immediately notice is the slum is one, two, three, four, five, just about adequately ventilated. The patient is still in a standing position. The scapula are moved out, which is intentional. Otherwise, rotation and position is adequate. You see that there's nothing very significant in the abdomen. The heart maybe looks at large. You can't really say because the lung is not very well inflated. The bony thorax looks normal for you know all practical purposes, and you see an opacity in the periphery of the left mid zone. So the upper zone, the mid zone, extending into the lower zone probably. The angle is sharp on the right, not very sharp on the left. So this is probably a pneumonia with a possible synnemonic effusion. So the inflammation here has caused the reactive collection of fluid in the pleural cavity, which has gone and layered off in the most dependent portion. All right. So this is a pneumonia with possible pleural effusion. All right. Very straightforward. I'll give you a second to look at this X-ray again. There was a history of trauma some time ago. Patient was managed at another hospital, has now come to you saying that they are breathless and they have some chest pain. Yes. 
you need to refer this patient. Please don't stick an ICD into this. Why would you not want to stick an ICD into this? This is a diaphragmatic hernia. Okay, you don't see lung markings on the right side. You don't really see anything wrong in the abdomen, but you can't face the dome of the diaphragm on the left. It's obscured. You can't see it. But what you can see is there is this very mottled lucency. It's not, you know, a normal lucency like the right lung. It's very mottled. It doesn't look quite all right. And you can't see a proper lung, even a collapsed lung for that matter, on the left side. What you will also appreciate is that the mediastinum is not in the center. The mediastinum is moved a little bit to the opposite side. You can argue with me that um, the X-ray is not taken in perfect position. There is rotation, yes, but the trachea is also deviated, and I would push for um, this be a little bit of mediastinal shift. If you look at the if it just works, yeah. So if you look at the CT, what you would see here is sorry about that. Yeah. So what you would see in this CT. Is that come on? I want to play. Yeah, so if this decides to play, if it's, it's been fussy, so what you what you'll notice here is that there's a defect in the diaphragm. If you see when this thing replays out the time. Yeah, so what you can see here is that the dome of the diaphragm is intact on the right side, and the dome of the diaphragm is not intact here. There is a defect here, and there is herniation of power loops into the thoracic cavity. So this is being a little tardy. Yeah. So this is a sagittal view of the same individual. You see an intact dome of the diaphragm on the right side, but you will see a defect in the diaphragm here, and there is herniation of bowel loops into the thoracic cavity, which has led to a massive traumatic diaphragmatic hernia. So where is the lung, you might ask? The lung has actually collapsed and moved to the top of the hemithorax, and therefore you can't see it. So see if this works. It's just not agreeing to play. So maybe if you give me just a second. Ah, so I don't know for some reason this is not working. I'm sorry about that, but we proceed to this one. This one was a history of, so the previous one was a traumatic diaphragmatic hernia that you have to be careful about. You can't see an epsilateral hemidiaphragmatic dome and you see probable collapse of the lung and you see a very mortal lucency in the hemithorax, which is because of herniated bowel loops. Right. All right. So the next one was a young individual who had a history of fall, trauma to the right side and pain in the right side of the chest. Told to be normal, but he's come to you now with persistent pain. All right, so look at each side individually. Look at the ribs on the right side. All right. And posterior ribs. Compare them with the opposite side. You can see the anteriors. You can see the posterior. I hope you found what we're looking for. That's essentially this area. So if you see, the cortices here are not intact. The rib has a slightly expanded view, uh, appearance, and the cortex may be deficient or broken in the inferior and the posterior aspects. This is in the posterior portion of the rib. This is multiple rib fractures. And that's why the individual had pain. Like Betsy said, you don't have to do much. There's no pneumothorax. There's no pleural effusion. Analgesia, analgesia, and a little more analgesia. Okay. No history was given for this because you just saw an X-ray. The lung fields are actually all right. Mediastinum is fairly okay. The bones look fine. This is not okay. That is air under the diaphragm. This individual had a hollow viscous perforation, but was somehow stable enough to stand. This is a PA view, mind you. This is not an AP view. All right. Okay. Routine health checkup. Nothing very significant. No uh, history wise. What is the first thing you would do when this patient presents? This X-ray is presented to you. 
when you get this radiograph on your monitor or in hand, what is the first thing that you would do? Ask your technician if you were not present or you have not exposed this individual yourself. Ask the technician if the side marker is correct. Is this a flipped X-ray? If this is a flipped X-ray, this is just you know going to be left and everything is then, then sorted out. There's no problem at all. But if this was on the right side, what does this become? Follow the abdomen. You notice something is off. The funding gas shadow is over here. This is the spleen and that is the liver of whatever you can see of it. The bones appear fairly OK. You're not really expecting anything wrong with the bones. The lungs appear, you know, nice. Well aerated, well aerated. There is no real abnormality in the lung. It looks electric, but the heart is pointing to the apex of the heart, points to the left side. Funding gas shadow also on that side, splenic shadow also on that side. Is this just dextrocardia? Or is this situs inversus? When all of them are on the left, this is situs inversus. So if this marker is incorrectly you know, placed, this is actually supposed to be left. This is a flipped radiograph. All right. This would be normal. If the site marker was correct, this is truly the patient's right. This would be a situs inversus. How would you confirm this if this individual presented to you and you, your technician ran off for lunch? He's not picking up your calls. What would you do? Palpate. See if you can feel the apex of the heart. OK, this may be a lady, so you can't palpate it through the breast tissue. What would you do? Auscultate, see where the apex is. It's on the right side. OK, that establishes your diagnosis. Percuss for the liver or auscultate for the stomach. If either of them you know, corroborates your finding of a dextrocardia, this becomes situs inversus. All right. I think that's all I have for you today. OK, so there's actually hardly any people left here. There's only about you know, 19 people and half of us are organizers and speakers. So if anyone has a doubt from whatever you've seen in Betsy's presentation or in mine, if you'd like to ask it to us now, shoot. I don't know if this chat box thing is working, so you can either unmute yourself and speak or raise your hand. Either which, either. Yes, Rishikesh has a doubt. Shoot. Uh, could you explain the 15th one, the slide more 15? I think I got that there was a there was an error with the slide changing, so I was struggling to find slide which changing? X-ray it was. Okay, just give yeah. me a second. Yeah, is this the one? Um, the change it's, for you? It's, it's not changing. I, I can see it's 15 or 30 in mine, and I'm not sure if uh, you've okay, moved so, to it. Okay, no, so I've I've moved back to 15 of 30. I'll just switch to 16. Okay. Can you see the change happen? Oh, uh, no. No? Okay, I'll just give it a second. Maybe it's taking time to... Uh, to refresh change for all of you. Just Has to confirm, now, is number 16 the slide with the ICD inserted? Number 16 is the, yes, yes, that's the one I've displayed on my screen. I'm switching yeah. back to 15. Betsy, has it changed for you? I can see number 15, yeah. Okay, good. Rishikesh, what about you? Um, it's not changing for me, but I, I'm on 15 now because I can move it separately on my own. OK, so what was your doubt? Um, I mean, I if, if you could explain it again, uh, I, I, I okay. couldn't. I couldn't. Uh, OK, so this individual had maybe some uh, chest pain on the right side and presented to you with. This area. All right, so what you would see is when you look at the abdomen, you don't see anything significant. Fundic air shadow is here. Left lung looks all right. Bony thorax is fine by all means. No rib fractures, no trauma. Patient doesn't even have a history of trauma. But what you would see is there is a collapsed right lung margin here, beyond which you don't see any vascular markings. It's jet black. It's loosened in the pleural cavity. And that's why we deem this to be a pneumothorax. All right. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And what we did subsequently was put in an intercostal vein, which
partially re-expanded the lung by um, evacuating the pneumothorax. Whatever was left is what you see beyond the collapsed lung margin. Okay, good. Thank you, Rishikesh. Thank you. Anyone else has a doubt or has a question you'd like to ask either from today's session or the last times? All right, it doesn't seem like anyone has questions. Jetin is back on screen. Um, I just take a minute to thank the organizers. Thank you all for participating. Um, and thank you, Betsy. That was a lovely, uh, you know, couple of presentations. Uh, good job. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Clyde. Uh, thank you, Dr. Betsy, uh, for the very uh, detailed uh, presentations on chest X-rays. Uh, hopefully this is useful for everyone. And, uh, you know, uh, the most important thing is that you should be able to implement this in your practice. So. We hope that we were of use to uh, everyone in that way. So again, uh, just another reminder to fill in the uh, feedback forms uh, for whoever is left. And uh, also uh, kindly spread the word again. We'll be updating you uh, regarding the future classes and uh, we'll be letting you know as soon as possible. All right. So we have more classes planned and uh, we have a, lo a lot more uh, content coming up. So. Uh, please uh, be on the lookout for the schedule. And uh, again, thank you everyone for attending and uh, thank you, Dr. Betsy and thank you, Dr. Clyde. Uh, I think we can conclude the session for today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.